So I think I was given the, the challenge of being the moderator of the next panel. I think the argument is very simple, is I could not keep the time on the previous panel, and I still want to be invited again to Oporto. So though this is my last chance to keep things on track and to visit Luzia again in Oporto. So without further ado, very interesting panel. The eighth panel, it will be fully online building strategies and I, I saw the speakers which are very curious also to hear the hear their, their thoughts so i'll start with the uh, first doctora karina carvalho executive director of transparency international chapter of portugal so um, dr karina looking forward to hear your thoughts and what is also the vision of transparency international in portugal and globally so the floor is yours thank you hello thank you so much i don't know if you can listen to me Perfectly, thank you. Yes, we can, thank you. I'm deeply sorry for not being able to be uh, with you uh, as I wish in presence, but I'm currently in Oslo and I'm speaking um, on my hotel room. So forgive me for the <laughs> whole the scenario. Uh, so um, I, I'm going to, 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 to be more specific on partnerships uh, for creating impact, because to be honest, we in Portugal, we don't work uh, so much uh, on education as we wish, although um, in, in, a, in a global level, Transparency International has some work to showcase already. And, and, and I will be keen to, to, to also to talk to you a bit about it. So uh, we are the Portuguese chapter of Transparency International. Transparency International is uh, a global coalition of uh, civil society organizations, NGOs against corruption. We have a presence in more than uh, 100 countries, and, and fortunately, we are also in Portugal since uh, 2010. Uh, Transparency International, as a global coalition, we work together as one, as a, a, a wide movement of organization against corruption uh, and, and, and um, trying to, to boost good governance and, and with that sustainable development as well and chasing kleptocrats and chasing the corrupts uh, all over the world. So in the core of our organization, community leadership and, and building strategies uh, are, are always in place. Um, we um, approved the new strategy, strategy 2030 called um, holding power to account for the common goods. And there are uh, two specific key objectives that I think are, are, are uh, aligned with today's today's meeting. The first objective is key objective six, expand civic space for accountability. And we have you know two sets of sub goals that uh, we work uh, to improve. So to enhance freedom and security uh, for activists, whistleblowers and journalists. And this is something that we work uh, together with our colleagues namely from OCCRP under the Global Anti-Corruption Consortium. And I will discuss it further, but in other networks that uh, TI as a movement is engaged globally and also at the national level and increase channels for uh, people to demand results for the common good. So we work a lot uh, as well on awareness raising, right? leverage the outreach for, for uh, anti-corruption uh, anti -corruption work. And there's also the key objective seven, which is called build, build community leadership against corruption. And in this specific uh, objective, we work on advocacy uh, uh, um, goals related to a number, a number of topics. And we also uh, have, uh, or have a particular interest in developing the next generation of leaders within all sectors of society that can support anti-corruption fight and, and support uh, good governance all over the world. Uh, on that note, uh, I would like to share with you that we recently launched a new initiative called the Youth Integrity Initiative. It was approved during uh, one of our annual membership meetings, the one from 2020, and we are now uh, working collaboratively to boost this initiative uh, to all the countries where we have in presence. The Youth Integrity Initiative in particular is the one uh, uh, that I think it, it, it's pretty much aligned with the UNODC uh, uh, initiatives such as Education for Justice, and other initiatives because we have integrity schools, uh, uh, for example, in Lithuania, uh, in Turkey, but in, in many other countries. And we also partner with universities to design, implement and develop training programs or training courses like 
um, summer courses or winter courses or autumn courses on integrity and, and anti-corruption issues. Uh, and in Portugal, I can tell you that we uh, organized a very small festival called Festival Transparente. And this, this initiative aims to engage you know, young people, a younger generation uh, uh, to, 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 to assist anti-corruption anti uh, efforts, because sadly, uh, anti-corruption as a cause uh, uh, it still still needs uh, to be boost, boosted within within the younger generation, at least in my view and in Portugal in particular. Uh, we have more than 1,000 members in Portugal, individual members, but sadly, uh, most of our members are uh, over 30 year old and we still don't have as many women as we should have, uh, I believe. Um, specifically on what we do, STI Portugal, uh, I will talk to you about four main community building strategies. The first one um, is RedGov. RedGov is a network for good governance and sustainable development in the Lusophony. It's an informal network. And this network was uh, launched by, by us, TI Portugal, in 2017. And we have already nine civil society organizations from Angola, Mozambique, Santo Tomé e Príncipe, Equatorial Guinea, Guinea-Bissau, and Brazil. And we also have uh, 12 academics and activists engaged in the network. The network aims mostly uh, uh, to advance commitments uh, uh, in human rights, anti-corruption, and, and SDGs in all the countries uh, that belong to the community of Portuguese-speaking countries. And um, what we do is that we develop capacity building uh, uh, initiatives or strategies um, like joint advocacy campaigning. Uh, uh, sometimes we work to apply common projects um, uh, and, and, and also for knowledge sharing. But our main goal is to, to monitor compliance, uh, for example, with the UNCAC or other international conventions and international standards so that we can better monitor what's happening under the, 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 the community of Portuguese speaking countries. Um, the other initiative, um, uh, and Ilya will, 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 will talk more about it, of course, is the GAC, the Global Anti-Corruption Consortium. The Global Anti-Corruption Consortium is an, a joint initiative between Transparency International and OCCRP. So under this joint initiative, what we do is that we collaborate actively with journalists all over the world in, in very specific topics related to illicit financial flaws, uh, money laundering, asset recovery, now more recently on, on, the, on the Russian sanctions as well. Um, here in Portugal, we were pretty much engaged uh, with the CCRP as well as with Will and others uh, to work on the Luanda leaks case and, and also on golden, on golden visas. We think that the collaboration between civil society uh, activists and journalists is key uh, uh, to boost transparency and, and integrity, uh, also because it is a way of surpassing the length and the duration of judicial cases most of the time. So I think over the last years, what we saw is that every time journalists and civil society organizations match in joint advocacy work and also in, in common projects, we can make the, the world move a, a little bit faster. Uh, and I think that's that's a really positive outcome for 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 this community uh, uh, building strategy. And there are also other opportunities that we are uh, uh, taking very recently in the field of development cooperation. For example, we have two projects. Uh, uh, one is is about to finish, but it's ongoing, and the other will be launched in July in Equatorial Guinea. Uh, and these projects allow us to partner with local civil society organizations and also to support them financially through the cascade financing system of Europaid uh, in terms of capacity building uh, in the sense that uh, we have a human rights and good governance observatory. This week, we just launched a new report on human rights uh, uh, in, in Equatorial Guinea, but this is a way uh, that you know, organizations from the global, global North as Transparency International Portugal and organizations from the global South as EG Justice can work together and boost anti-corruption commitments, but most of all to denounce and, and to work as a watch as watch, watchdogs uh, uh, against corruption, uh, able to 
uh, do something that uh, sometimes it's, it's very hard for um, NGOs that are in very difficult environments is to provide them with a voice that can be heard by others. So aside the, 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 the borders of, of these very specific, specific countries. Uh, and, and also we work on the protection of activists and whistleblowers under these, these, these initiatives. The last one, it may be a bit strange to share with you, but I think it's also uh, uh, building strategies. And this is why I'm currently in Oslo. It is called Clean Biz. And so our goal is to power up uh, uh, human rights and, 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 and sustainable development through anti-bribery. So working with small and medium-sized enterprises uh, so that they can comply with, uh, namely the OECD anti-bribery uh, convention, but mostly for businesses, uh, small, medium-sized businesses, to, for them to understand the impact of bribery and corruption in the countries they, they, they go to, to, to undertake businesses. Uh, and that, that happens uh, with us uh, when we see Portuguese companies going, for example, to Angola or even to Mozambique. So we think it's also important to uh, strengthen the links with the business sector so that the business sector understands that not only uh, uh, corruption and bribery has an impact in human rights and sustainable development in the countries that, that, um, that they're going to do uh, business with, but that that also affects competitiveness, uh, competition, uh, and, and that also uh, damages their, their reputation and of course uh, their, their businesses. So these are um, the things I would like to share with you. And of course, I think during the discussion, uh, I will be able to share much more. Thank you so much for your invitation again. And thank you so much to you all in the panel. Thank you, Dr. Karina Carvalho, for highlighting the framework of uh, Transparency International, always focusing the good governance, community leadership, awareness raising, and of course, being, building the next uh, generation of leaders. And of course, the Youth Integrity Initiative is a good example of the efforts of TI to basically consolidate the transformative power of education and important role of youth for the future. Thank you for that. I'm very pleased that I will hand over the moderation now to the original moderation, moderator, Dr. Ana Gomes, which is a former member of European Parliament, a former member of Portuguese Parliament. So Dr. Ana Gomes, I will hand over, over to you to take us through the next discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It's a great pleasure for me to be uh, with you in this, uh, uh, in this Congress uh, on this particular topic and in this particular panel to be able to go on with the moderation. Uh, we just heard Karina uh, Carvalho, who spoke on behalf of uh, Transparency uh, International Portugal, uh, which, of which I'm uh, um, honored to be a member, and um, how uh, she touched on the different activities uh, that uh, uh, very much uh, depend on uh, international partnerships and of course one of the partnerships we highlighted was with our with the organization um, uh, that uh, is represented by our next speaker Ilya Lozovsky who is a, a writer and uh, who is also the senior editor of organized crime uh, and corruption reporting project OCCRP which is so important in the in the, indeed um, articulating all these incredible uh, international partnerships that have produced already so relevant uh, um, exposure of corruption cases, forcing uh, authorities in different member uh, states and, 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 and European and, uh, and global states to, to, and other states to act. Uh, I just would uh, like to uh, uh, underline the importance of a, 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 um, a particular uh, investigative case that I followed um, on, on uh, Jan Kuciak and partner, who, a journalist that was murdered in Slovakia for exposing uh, corruption. Uh, it was really uh, outstanding the work done by all, but in particular by OCCRP in indeed putting pressure on the authorities to act and, uh, and uh, disclosing what was uh, um, to be found about uh, uh, their murder. 
by the criminal networks, uh, and uh, also um, even uh, a, a very recent, um, a very recent uh, investigation that they just put out about uh, asking very, uh, very significant questions. What has um, what have the, the, the Russian kleptocrats uh, having to do with uh, uh, cryptocurrency scammers, uh, with leaders of organized crime uh, and solicitors of uh, sex with uh, underage girls? What do they have in common? And the answer is real estate in Dubai. <laughs> That's, I think, one of the latest um, uh, projects that uh, OCCRP uh, brought to our attention. And without further ado, I will ask Ilya to take the floor and let us know more about your um, incredible work. Thank you very much uh, for that lovely and very generous intro. I hope everybody can hear me. Can you give a yeah. thumbs up or something? Uh, good. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm really happy to be here and grateful for the invitation. Um, I won't talk too long because I think we could have a useful discussion. And um, you know, we've got Will here from uh, another organization that is uh, in some ways uh, very similar to ours. Uh, but let me talk about um, OCCRP. And I should mention, uh, thank you for mentioning Jan Kuciak, our colleague, um, and who was tragically murdered along with his fiance in Slovakia. Um, and um, I just want to mention that we have a film that just recently came out about that an investigative film about the killing and who was responsible and how the nexus of organized crime and um, corruption is really um, at the heart of these tragic affairs when journalists are killed. So the film is called The Killing of a Journalist. It just had its premiere in Toronto. So everybody, please look it up and see it. It's I've seen it. It's very good. Um, so OCCRP, what are we? And I think this theme of uh, networked work and collaboration is going to pop up again and again on this panel and OCCRP is set up exactly in that way. OCCRP is an international group of independent journalists and the way we work is kind of a system of member centers. We have dozens of member centers around the world. Each of them is a group of local journalists in so we have one in Ukraine, we have one in Serbia, we have one in um, you know, Venezuela, we have all over the world, we've grown a lot. After starting in Southeast Europe, we've grown a lot to spread across the world in recent years. And this is really that the heart of our model that we have a central base of editorial talent, we have a data team, we have a research team, we have all sorts of technological tools to help researchers cover financial crime and corruption and organized crime. Um, and those central resources are distributed uh, to these spokes around the world and so we believe we believe that um the our goal is to empower the local journalists on the ground with our resources that we receive um, to enable them to do their best work um, so a collaboration with us in the center us um, english language editors and all the other teams that i mentioned helping the people on the ground who really know their countries who really know the political players i mean i think this is the way of doing it because it's it's really unfortunate when um, you know large, well-funded Western organizations, you know, parachute a journalist into a country where they've never been before. They go around, use a fixer to get some information, write a story, and then fly out and maybe never go there again. We don't believe in doing that. We believe in empowering the locals and working with the locals. And a lot of the money that we are granted, um, you know, goes to them as well. The other reason we are set up this way is because we believe that it it takes a network to fight a network. And what we're really exposing is networks of organized crime and corruption, not isolated incidents of organized crime and corruption. And it's just impossible in, the, in 2022 to be in one country and to really get a grip on corrupt schemes, because sure, you may find some corrupt scheme that happened in that country specifically, but the money will not stay there because the people who steal the money, whether they're a corrupt official or a criminal or whoever else, are going to take it and they're going to invest in Dubai real estate, or they're going to invest in London real estate, or they're going to put it in a bank account that's linked to an offshore firm 10,000 miles away. And these schemes reach all the way across the world. And this is the fundamental sort of contradiction that I think is our main mission is to expose. Corruption is not just in some faraway corrupt country. Corruption is all around the world and the Western global financial system enables it 
teams of lawyers, teams of accountants, real estate agents, anybody you can think of all over the world are helping corrupt wealth flow into the West and be laundered and separated from its corrupt origins and ends up in Miami or in New York or in London or in Dubai. And this is the system we're exposing. And that's why we are shaped like a network because what we're fighting is a network. Um, so, um, you know, the Russian asset tracker, of course, is a good example of that. Uh, the war is in Ukraine, but Russian corrupt, corrupt Russian money is all over the world. Um, and of course, um, and I, I want to use a few specific examples of stories we've worked on to show how, um, how we sort of trace those networks. But before I get into the specific stories, I just want to say, you know, um, everyone's been talking about collaborations. Um, Karina mentioned the GAC initiative, Global Anti-Corruption um, Consortium. I think it's a really elegant solution to the problem of you know, journalists should not be activists and activists are not journalists, but we as journalists want our work to have an impact. And so partnership, a partnership in this way where we do the journalistic work and then the activists, the advocates can take it and move it forward. Um, I just think it's a really great uh, partnership and um, you know, I'm really, I think it's pretty innovative. And um, I think there are probably still a lot of journalists out in the world who uh, would be uncomfortable with something like that. But I don't believe that a journalist especially not us. I don't think we can be neutral, you know, neutral on the issue of corruption, on the issue of democracy, because this is at the heart of, you know, the fight for democracy in our time. So I'm just so happy that that part that project has continued to grow and bear fruit. And if you just Google, um, you know, if you want to find out more, just Google OCCRP, GACC, GAC, or TI GAC, and you'll find the info pages that our organizations maintained about that project. Um, ICIJ too. I see, um, I'm sure Will will talk about how they're structured, but you know, without their um, collaborating with them, many of our projects would not have been possible because so many of our stories are based on data that they have obtained um, and shared with us. And of course, it goes, you know, vice versa as well. And we've shared data with a lot of other organizations too. So when we're fighting against the best financed people on earth, with the best lawyers and the most expensive accountants and shell company after shell company, you know, we are not as well funded as they are and we need to work together to um, expose them and so it's this this kind of you know panel that i'm um, fortunate enough to be uh sitting on here is just a, a great example of how organizations like ours can do that so let's just uh keep doing more of this and um i will end my um presentation just with showing a few of the projects that we've done to kind of showcase where our work takes us um, so I'm wondering if uh, this share screen will work. Let me try it real quick. The first one I'm going to start with is I mentioned that corruption um, begins. Sorry, one second here. Corruption begins, doesn't end in um, some country far away from Europe or from the Western world, but it, it, but it begins there. So um, we do work on the ground, as I say, with our member centers. And I'm going to pull up a project. Uh, one second, let me see if I can get this share screen to work. And here it is. This project came out a few years ago. I hope you can see it. It's called Plunder and Patronage in the Heart of Central Asia. This is one that I like to show partially because I was very heavily involved in this, but I think it's a great um, showcase. This is about Kyrgyzstan, a country in Central Asia, where we essentially exposed, um, we were working on a network of, looking into a network of smugglers um, who were making huge amounts of money, collaborating with corrupt officials to, um, to uh, basically um, trade goods without having to pay customs and pocketing enormous amounts of money off of that. And one of the sources on this project, this man pictured here in the center, uh, this young man with the documents, he was actually murdered in the middle of communicating with our reporters. He gave us a lot of documents and then he was killed. And he was the guy that this criminal gang had hired, actually a criminal family had hired to launder the money that they earned. So we have multiple stories, you know, we call him the $700 million man. Um, and then we have an investigation into his murder. We have an in investigation into the family of the official who was enabling this corruption. We have separate stories about the family of smugglers and how they um, obtained this money. 
So this is, it, to a large extent, this is a local Kyrgyzstan story about local corruption. And in fact, after this came out, uh, uh, the country had a revolution when the official who we wrote about, um, his political party did very well in the next election and the people weren't happy. So um, this, and he was sanctioned by the United States, this official. So I can say that this project had some impact and we, pub we always publish all of our documents so that our readers can convince themselves that, you know, this is not fake news. And we always want, in, it's really important to maintain our commitment to showing our work, not just uh, telling a story, but showing the work that goes behind it. Um, so this is the story of, you know, a typical story of where the money can come from. Now, where does the money go? As we said, the main character at the heart of the story is a money launderer, because if you are a corrupt official or a corrupt criminal family in Kyrgyzstan and you earn $700 million, you're not going to keep those $700 million in Kyrgyzstan because who knows, somebody could take it from you or, uh, you know, what are you going to spend it on? So you want to go and take it into the West. And so the next step, kind of, if the first step is making the money, the next step is laundering it. So I'm going to pull up the next story, and that is the laundromats. And we have, can you see this page now that says laundromats explained with the purple background? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have done over the years a total of four major projects about laundromats. And what we call a laundromat is um, a large system usually made up of dozens and dozens of offshore companies with bank accounts and the money goes in one end and then the money gets split up among the different companies and sent around and shuffled around and then it comes out somewhere on the other side and by the time it comes out on the other side you have no idea where it came from or who it really belongs to and these are services essentially and some of the money that goes through them might be legitimate but it's questionable because they use a lot of techniques to disguise you know, they use fake transactions as explanations for each fake um, contracts as explanations for each transaction. But a lot of the money is the proceeds of crime. So we have the Azerbaijani laundromat, which is used by a lot of Azerbaijani officials. By the way, money from that laundromat ended up in Europe with officials who later uh, went to observe the elections in Azerbaijan and found that there was nothing wrong with them after all. Uh, so that kind of thing can happen. The Troika laundromat is more based in Russia. Then we have the another Russian laundromat. And each of these projects, you know, you can click on it and it's another 15, 20 stories and there's more added all the time. These is, this is based on leaks of data generally. Um, but so this is kind of the middle part of that chain. The, the corrupt money is made and now it's washed into the West and laundered and put into real estate or something else. And so just to end, I will show a, another project we did about where some of that money can end up. And everybody recently has been talking about um, our Russian asset tracker. We got a huge amount of interest in that story, understandable reasons, of course, given Russia's um, absolutely monstrous uh, war in Ukraine. But I just wanted to show off another one. We did a project on the ruling family of Azerbaijan, the Aliyevs. And this, you know, this is a long story that talks about how they uh, used offshore companies to secretly acquire property in London. And this, by the way, thanks to um, ICIJ, because this data comes from the Pandora Papers, which is a leak of documents that um, was shared with us by ICIJ, enabled us to do this story. And um, in addition to the story, we made a virtual tour. We found so many properties that they own in London that we just couldn't you know, leave it at having a few pictures in the story. We had to do something more. So what we did is an interactive walking tour where you can actually go to this map and start the tour and it'll take you step by step through London. And I'm actually in London now. So I'm looking forward to actually doing a walk of this when the weather gets nicer. And you can click and see, you know, we have the price, we have the size, we have um, a description of each property and the offshore companies that secretly own it that, you know, in the UK, it's good, the property registry, you can actually buy the records and find out who owns any given property. The problem is when that owner is an offshore company and you can't determine who owns the offshore company, or it's an offshore company that has another offshore company behind it that has another offshore company behind it. So I'll just click through a few of these to give you the idea, but this goes on and on and on. It includes, um, posh apartments that maybe used, are used by the family themselves. It includes uh, investment properties that are office buildings or other things. One of them is a pub. 
you know, we've got historic townhouse. Uh, you've got uh, three apartments in this building uh, and penthouse apartments. You've got a house right by Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park. My favorite example is, I think it might be this one. It's an office building that is owned by the 11 year old son of President Aliyev of Azerbaijan, <laughs> because he, uh, not anymore, but at the time he was 11 years old and he was actually the owner of the offshore company that owned this property. And apparently no one is ashamed to enable things like that to happen through extremely legally, you know, through the London legal system. So this will go on forever. There's a hotel, there's a building next door to the hotel. This is Sicilian Avenue in the heart of London. $700 million of property belonging to one family who imprisoned dissidents, who imprisoned one of our colleagues for many years, who have absolutely destroyed all opposition parties. You can find a, two dozen stories just in the last couple of years of the cruel and undemocratic things that President Aliyev has done with his country. And this is what London lawyers and London um, accountants enable his family to do is to park all of their ill-gotten money uh, in this in properties like this. And so I think this is why we exist, to expose these schemes with the help of our partners on the ground and with the help of partners like ICIJ and TI to take our work further. And so I'll just end with that same message that, you know, without this collaboration, I think we would all be totally helpless at the hands of these people, uh, but we're not. So let's keep at it. And um, I will be happy to um, participate in whatever discussion takes place. And thank you for having me. So now I have to stop sharing my screen. There we go. OK, that's it. Thank you, Ilya, for a, such a, a lively and, uh, and um, uh, curious, provoking uh, presentation. I'm sure uh, people will follow up on the uh, links you uh, highlighted to us. And um, you rightly um, said that the cooperation of uh, uh, um, international cooperation of journalists, namely those under the OCCRP and the uh, ICIG, uh, is crucial. Uh, ICIG is uh, our next speaker is Will Fitzgibbon from the International Consortium of uh, uh, Investigative Journalists, which is behind the Panama Papers. Uh, the Paradise Papers, the Pandora Papers, and many other uh, crucial presentations, namely for us in Portugal and the Portuguese-speaking countries, uh, the Luanda Leaks. Uh, uh, and you've been uh, exactly uh, showing how these international networks of journalists can make a hell of a difference if they really work to um, not only receive the the the, the significant data that the digital um, uh, environment now uh, enables you to get, but actually to read it intelligently and to expose it intelligently for the public to understand what is at stake, but also for the authorities, namely in the judiciary to act. What happens is, what, what often happens, and this is certainly the case here in Portugal, is that we don't see uh, much difference being made by the, the the judiciary, who should be the one now acting on those uh, uh, very comprehensive um, uh, data that have been put out by by organizations such as uh, OCCRP and the, the ICIJ, um, and and uh, and despite all the work and the pressure put by national organizations such as Transparency International. Maybe, you, Will, you can talk to us about that. Uh, uh, I know that often you put out tweets uh, highlighting how uh, your, uh, um, your um, investigations led to significant developments in terms of the fight for accountability, the fight against impunity. But there are as well uh, many other cases where this is not happening. And uh, how do you... Uh, uh, how do you, have you considered how to better address that? We, in the previous um, uh, debate, uh, I saw that people were um, raising the question of values. And it's not just, I would just offer my own uh, perspective that it's not just about values to instill in the young people, but actually values that should be nurtured uh, in the professional groups, namely in the groups that um, 
that um, that are dominant in the, for instance, in the judiciary, and we don't see those values there. Unfortunately, in a country like Portugal, uh, there are individual cases definitely that get out of the norm. But the norm is um, is passivity, connivance uh, in action, uh, and and therefore no accountability, no impunity. I, I just would like to recall that I learned recently that even on the Wanda Leaks, a case that had so ma major uh, consequences for Portugal, showing that Portugal was indeed a laundromat. <laughs> um, and it's not only for Isabel dos Santos, of course, uh, nothing really happened. Uh, and even the people involved have not really been indicted, not, nor in Portugal, nor elsewhere. Um, so, uh, We'll, we are also, of course, very significant was the, the revelation of the, the um, Paradise Papers, where you actually focused on enablers, uh, all this industry of lawyers and accountants and uh, uh, all sorts of uh, professions that are financial uh, and juridical professions that are really the ones organizing the schemes to serve this uh, uh, organized crime namely in laundering the, the profits of the crime. And uh, I would like to uh, ask you to, if you can actually uh, focus on that, especially when you, we, are, uh, we see developing uh, this industry also, a correlated industry of the, the slaps, the, the, the strategic litigation actions to actually silence journalists or activists or whistleblowers. Uh, and we are uh, fortunately, uh, as a consequence of our very unfortunate case where a uh, main source of uh, yours, uh, Daphne Caruana Galicia was murdered in Malta. Uh, we have now uh, the beginnings of a, a, a Nanti, uh, a, a Daphne law, a Nanti slap uh, directive being prepared at the European level. Maybe you um, have already planned to talk to us about that. Will you have the floor? Thank you very much. <clears throat> Anna, it's nice to see you again. Uh, and thank you for all your public contributions on these issues that help keep the debate alive and move the needle. Hello, Karina, good to see you. Uh, and hi, Ilya, nice to see you and hear from you also. And thank you to the invitation today. Uh, to be here. It's a real pleasure to talk about both what can make us optimistic when it comes to collaboration and the future of anti-corruption efforts, but also things that might give us pause, reasons to perhaps remain pessimistic, but to channel that pessimism into uh, efforts and to double down on the work that we all do uh, that works, I think, in such, in such harmony. Um, as Anna has pointed out, uh, ICIJ has a very long, complicated name, and we're also not very creative when it comes to project titles. We are the organisation that did Panama Papers, Paradise Papers, now Pandora Papers, uh, as well as uh, Luanda Leaks and, uh, and other projects like that. Um, and ICIJ really has been at the forefront of international collaboration for a very long time. Um, you know, it's so common now to hear of the word collaboration uh, and for people to speak of it as though it's easy to do. And I think the lesson that ICOJ has learned over the years, and I think it's a lesson that equally applies to members of parliament seeking to collaborate, that equally applies to academics seeking to collaborate, and especially to law enforcement uh, and members of the judiciary, for example, is that it isn't easy. Um, and that I think is something that we often forget, that somehow because of the importance of the issues that we work on, tackling cross-border crime, holding the powerful to account, uh, making sure that those kleptocrats and dictators that Ilya spoke of, uh, for example, sleep just a little less comfortably each night. Um, that, doesn't, that doesn't happen automatically. Uh, each organization and each industry has their own culture that can sometimes be in contradiction to that notion of collaboration, even when we're all fighting the same fight. And my experience from collaborative journalism is that it's a two step forward, one step back model. There are always gonna be uh, frustrations and even failures when it comes to collaboration. Uh, I can't tell you the amount of times that I've 
cried into my breakfast cereal when a journalist from a country where dozens of politicians have been in the Pandora Papers hiding assets, where it's where two, three, four, or even five journalists from that country have declined to participate in an ICAJ project, for example. Um, you know, it just shows how uh, structurally and industrially uh, there are still challenges to this collaboration, despite the fact that I think there's such a demonstrated track record of the value and impact of collaboration. Um, ICIJ, uh, as has been pointed out, we work in collaboration with and really in complete complementarity to the work of OCCRP, who are always one of our first ports of call uh, when we get major projects. Uh, the, these projects don't happen overnight. Uh, you know, journalists don't wake up one morning to 11 million documents in their inbox and they don't wake up overnight to have 750,000 emails from Isabel Dos Santos's uh, private army of financial advisors. Um, but once we do get that data, ICAJ's model is to be as international as possible to share that with reporters in as many countries as possible. We don't have a top-down model. Uh, we're very decentralized. We trust and empower reporters in each country to tell their own stories, to choose their own stories and decide how that should be told. And I think that's important because from my experience uh, reporting across Africa in particular, I'm the ICAJ is a coordinator for African partnerships, measuring uh, impact when it comes to anti-corruption uh, is culturally and ge geographically different. And I think sometimes we in countries in Europe or in the United States or in my own Australia, uh, we bring uh, even subconsciously sometimes, unconsciously, our own uh, metrics to anti-corruption. We say, well, it's only a success if, uh, if a criminal case is open, or it's only a success if uh, tax monies or financial penalty penalties are imposed. And of course, that's the goal in all jurisdictions. That's the gold standard of asset recovery, of tackling financial crime. But we do, I think, also have to recognize that uh, for practical reasons, historical reasons, uh, colonial reasons, and the legacy of uh, all the history that's gone before us, there are jurisdictions where that isn't likely to happen tomorrow. Um, and that should not always discourage us. If we were only as journalists and anti-corruption fighters to focus on countries where we could beat our chest and tell donors how wonderful we are and how much impact we've had, then we wouldn't report on more than half the countries on the planet. And I think that's valuable to keep in mind so that we continue to do that work, even though sometimes the impacts seem unsatisfying. Um, in the Panama Papers, for example, there were so many politicians who, according to Nigerian law, had broken those laws. They'd committed uh, criminal actions in not disclosing assets and not disclosing their ownership of London property, for example. And yet these people are still running for president today. They're still sitting in the Senate today. And something that I find very and constantly inspiring about the work that ICAJ does is how we work with these reporters who notwithstanding the fact that they receive death threats, that they earn uh, very little money, that they are often sanctioned by prosecutors and increasingly by tax inspectors. There's this very strange and nefarious new or fairly new world in which reporters who are increasingly better understanding illicit financial flows are finding themselves more attacked by uh, tax and financial services within their own country who are using almost this new uh, interest that groups like ICAJ and OCCRP and Transparency have given to illicit financial flows to target journalists, accusing them of, of avoiding taxes. So despite all these pressures, journalists are still passionate about telling these stories. And they know that their president's not going to resign overnight, but they do take comfort in the fact that the next day there's a group of their citizens sitting at the taxi station in Lagos or um, walking through a mall in Nairobi, Kenya, for example, who read their stories, who maybe heard their stories on the radio or the television and are still paying attention to that. And I think that's important that we recognize that kind of, that kind of impact as well when it comes to fighting corruption and that we can't hope and assume that all countries are going to uh, respond in the same way. Uh, and I mentioned Luanda Leaks, uh, which is a project that I worked for a long time on was in Angola 
twice. Uh, and it was a journey. It was an up and down journey. One day you thought things were really going to happen. The next day you put your hand in your head and you said, all right, nothing's going to happen. And Isabel dos Santos is going to happily live forever after in Russia or Dubai or where, or even worse, somewhere like London, for example, where there are um, court systems. But like Anna pointed out, um, we put a lot of effort in Luanda Leaks to not only telling Luanda Leaks through the lens of kleptocracy in Angola, but how this came about. And I think that is how it came about through the Western enablers from the United States to Europe. And I think it was only in February uh, this year that the European Central Bank put out a finding about Luanda Leaks, from which my main takeaway was why on earth did it take a journalist expose to force the European Central Bank to identify what was already under its nose. Um, once again, as Ilya pointed out, we as journalists receive far less funding than all of these international institutions uh, whose employees generally exist uh, you know, tax-free and ride around in nice cars, you know, whereas I just go to work on my bicycle every day. Um, and it's a constant reminder to us that um, as with the Russian assets that we're seeing today and the response of Western governments to Russian assets, the West knew, the enablers knew, the UK government knew exactly uh, about how its real estate, how its barristers and lawyers, how its accountants were being used and misused by autocrats, by oligarchs and by crooks. And for many, many years, it's only paid lip service. Um, similar thing happened in response to Luanda leaks. Um, and to be honest, uh, similar thing happens now every time that ICAJ does an investigation. Uh, the European Union, the European Parliament has wonderful members of it, but they've also become, they've almost become uh, in some ways like an automatic ICAJ investigation response unit. ICAJ puts out an investigation, there'll be a European Parliament uh, announcement saying this is wonderful, we're going to have a hearing. But as Anna points out, I think the question is what is next? Um, and in some ways the challenge now is upon us as anti-corruption fighters and transparency advocates to say, wonderful, thank you for paying attention. Thank you for recognizing that these issues that we've told you were problems for five or 10 years now are indeed problems, but let's move beyond uh, lip service, paying lip service to these issues. And I think that's an area where more interdisciplinary collaboration can really help along the lines of uh, what Ilya and Karina were talking about and where journalists really need to be forced to think more about uh, their profession, about how they tell stories and what they do after their investigation has been published. Uh, journalism, like all professions, sometimes can be slow to respond uh, and slow to change. And I think uh, more and more reporters are getting to that point of understanding that an investigation doesn't just stop at the moment of publication, but uh, especially in this anti-corruption space, that's something that we're all going to have to think uh, long and hard about in the future. I'm going to leave it there and uh, hope we have time for some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Uh, and uh, you, you rightly pointed out that uh, it is about um, uh, the follow-up uh, very much. Uh, the, the great work has been done by the journalists in the exposure, but they themselves are interested in the follow-up and I guess all the society is. And maybe uh, Karina could uh, actually develop how, how uh, civil society, organized civil society, namely uh, uh, via Transparency International, uh, is trying to uh, ensure that indeed the kinds of um, professionals that should act, really act and are, uh, feel the pressure to act. Um, but. Uh, uh, this is my question, and I, without further ado, I'll, I'll uh, open the floor to anyone from the audience who wants to uh, ask you questions. Anyone interested? And uh, we have someone in Oporto. Yeah. So I'm uh, waiting for the microphone to get to the lady, and she will make a question. Thank you. I have a question for Anna Gomes. Uh, you mentioned that there is a lack of repercussion uh, with the Luanda leaks, and there's also a lack of activity from the civil standpoint. Why do you think that from the civil standpoint of things, people don't really um, want to keep her in check, keep the woman that did that, the main person in check? Thank you. 
Other questions? To any of the speakers? So far from Lucia Raporto, no more questions. Maybe we can proceed from our side. Okay. So I, 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 I'll, I'll answer since you asked me that question directly, but then of course, any of the speakers will also give their point of view on this or any other points that have been raised. Why do I think that there's no action on Luanda Leaks? Well, first of all, there is no culture, no values. I'm sorry, that culture is about values indeed. And uh, most people uh, in our societies have lost values, I'm sorry to say. Money is the value. Uh, and people want to, you, you know, uh, there is no real ethics in the way uh, some professions uh, uh, develop their work. And that's why you see so many people in the certain professions uh, become enablers of these kinds of corrupt and criminal uh, networks. Uh, be it in organizing the uh, the corrupt schemes, be it in them in the money laundering uh, schemes itself, um, and uh, and therefore there are lots of interests, uh, and they are complicit. When a big uh, leak of uh, a big inquiry comes out, uh, as Will was saying, then uh, in the European Parliament you will have. Uh, uh, action on that, a further uh, digging of information, pointing out of who is responsible, recommendations, and then nothing happens. Uh, very rarely things happen. They might happen, I mean, let me say, some legislative changes in, uh, for instance, in uh, uh, anti-money laundering have occurred as a consequence of these revelations. The fourth, and in particular, the fifth anti-money laundering directive are clearly the result of what we learned through the different scandals. Uh, um, LuxLeaks and then uh, Panama Papers, uh, Paradise Papers and so on. But then the question is always, how is it enacted? And that's where the professionals in different uh, areas uh, uh, don't feel the motivation. Uh, or actually sometimes feel the opposite motivation because they are in a way captured by these uh, criminal industries in one way or another. But for me, for me particularly uh, galling is that here in Portugal in particular, and if you take the case of Luanda Leaks, um, it's not that the people didn't know. People knew even much before the, the Luanda Leaks came out. I myself had done a, an expose to the European Commission highlighting 40 companies who were vehicles for money laundering for Isabel dos Santos. They were not 40, as Luanda Leaks demonstrated, they were over 400. But even if they had acted on these 40, um, things could have been done earlier and they weren't done because there were no political will. On the contrary, the political will here in Portugal was to protect and keep doing the same. Uh, and nothing of my information was secret Everything was public, uh, in the public domain. And the people didn't act because they didn't want to act. There were too many interests, be it in the lawyers who were complicit who were orchestrating the schemes, be it in the accountants, be it in the consultants, uh, financial consultants involved, be it in the politicians captured from all, uh, all, sides, all, all, all sides, all sides. And then the judiciary, a lot of the information on the Luanda leaks was known to the judiciary since the so-called investigation hurricane, Furacão, and then Monte Branco. And they just didn't act because they didn't want to act. No one was brave enough. And there were as well several ways to actually um, persuade the professionals that there was no point in acting. And that's exactly why ever since the Luanda leaks were brought out and there were nevertheless consequences. The Baldo Shantz is not that I know living in Portugal anymore, but she's living elsewhere and showing up and she's not even indicted anywhere. Um, but, but of course the assets have not been seized. Most of the assets have not been seized. And if they have been seized, they have been seized in a way in Portugal that enables their dissipation 
until they will indeed be collected and uh, given back to, to the legitimate owners, be it the Portuguese state or the Angolan state. So everything is done to actually frustrate that. Even the sale of a, a, a main, um, one of our main vehicles, which was Eurobic, uh, is anything but transparent. And I'm afraid that she will end up collecting the profits of the sale of Eurobic somewhere in some offshore, thanks to the Portuguese enablers. And that means a lot of officials in the, in the public uh, institutions, but as well in the judiciary and so on, who haven't done their work. Uh, one more reason why indeed we need a civil society that really acts upon these important revelations of uh, organizations such as OCCRP and uh, uh, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. And that's, I guess, the role of organizations such as TI Portugal. Do you agree, Karina? I will end it to you now. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Um... Just to say that I follow and I sometimes feel very frustrated. Uh, and, and with this particular case, uh, Luanda leaks uh, more because uh, after two years, we don't see you know, uh, tangible results. And I think that's why people uh, think that nothing happened. But let me share maybe um, a positive uh, insight regarding that. Uh, if we, that um, as anti-corruption activists, and I'm the executive director of an anti-corruption organization. I cannot allow myself to frustrate, otherwise I would leave TI. That's, and, I, and I think, and it happens with you, because I think we need to, 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 to see also um, um, the small uh, successes stories. Um, I can share with you, for example, something that I think it's, it's critical. Of course, the role of enablers. Everyone now understands who are them. Right, and it is clear for people in the global north and in the global south. If you speak to a Portuguese citizen and they say, you know, the lawyers that help Isabel dos Santos, they know who they are, and they know what they're doing. And, and so I think that uh, uh, as many stories as we have, um, more clear will be uh, their participation and and and, and public um, uh, public uh, pressure, or or, or at least people condemning their attitude. But even in Angola, I think things changed, to be honest. For example, uh, um, if you go there, people can now be outspoken against corruption. <laughs> you know, five years ago, that was completely impossible. And today, everybody can speak up, speak up and, and be very loud against corruption and say, these people are corrupt. And in the past, they're not entitled to do it. They were be persecuted because of that, they will be in prison. When I say they, it's men and women and activists. Just remember the, 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 the some friend of ours that were uh, in prison uh, in 2016, 2015 and 2016. And currently, if people speak against corruption, they are not in prison. Uh, also at the country level, the government cannot say they don't, they don't have corruption problem, a widespread corruption problem. And that allows even international organizations such as OCISA or even when the UN system or even the European Union to start working with local organizations and funding local organizations in projects that are focused on corruption. So I think this is a, a development. Also for us here in Portugal. So we spent 10 years discussing the role of enablers. We spent 10 years saying, well, we need to see how these, uh, who, who are these political exposed uh, persons. We cannot, we cannot continue like this. And okay, right now, our message at least is understood. But I must say that without funding, it's impossible, both I think for journalists, but I can speak for, 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 for our case, civil society organizations cannot do their work on anti-corruption specifically without funding and without core funding. And I think this is clear. We need to be able to use the money that is granted to us by individual donations or uh, uh, other institutions the way we think suitable. So we don't need to execute projects in working in things that other things are appropriate. Because there are a lot of things happening all the time. We would love to, to be more, more, more able to, to work more with investigative journalists, but also with other organizations. I think 
we don't understand clearly, still we don't understand clearly the links between corruption and human rights, human rights abuses and offenses all over the world, and in the Portuguese speaking Africa in particular, because this is our mandate as CI Portugal. So to be honest, I think there's a lot of work to do, but I also think that um, we managed to do much with little, little, very little resources. Thank you, Karina. Uh, Will and, and Ilya, would you like to come in? Maybe you would like to also uh, tell us a bit about the role that um, strengthening the tax authorities, the tax systems could make a hell of a difference if uh, there would be the political will for that. Have you seen things change in this regard? Uh, I can jump in on that topic. Uh, I think you, Anna and Karina, did a very good job there of speaking to the, the frustrations, but also the positives uh, around uh, the work that we're all collectively engaged on. And I think it's similar when it comes to tax administrations. You know, uh, on the one hand, it's been wonderful to see uh, the increased engagement of tax authorities around the world uh, because tax, more or less, has now become a sexy topic. Like if you were a tax <laughs> lawyer or a tax expert or an illicit financial flows expert 10 years ago, you would have been the least popular person at a dinner party. But I think now you're the kind of person who many people want to talk to. They want to talk to you about or joke with you about where the oligarch or where Dos Santos is, has hid their millions and why they would choose Cyprus over Mauritius, over Panama, over Jersey, over Madeira, for example. Um, so it's great that that awareness exists, but quite clearly, and I see this in text exchanges I have with tax officials, especially in developing countries, uh, in Angola, in Madagascar, in uh, Zambia, uh, in Senegal, for example, they don't have the resources anywhere near what they need to turn information into reality. So it's a mix, in my experience, it's a mix of capacity, but also political will. Tax authorities are still very much dependent on their political uh, rulers, uh, prime ministers, ministers, and presidents, for example. So even with all the information at their disposal, um, information that's available um, through ICIJ's leak, off offshore leaks website, for example, Lots of these tax authorities can't do anything. But I think it does, in some cases, give a few people in a few countries the weapons to make a, to take a small step forward. And once again, that's what I take solace in. You know, um, uh, Senegal, for example, was able to finally scrap or cancel its tax treaty with Mauritius, the tax haven, for example, um, after lots of reporting showed just how terrible that tax treaty was. Um, and had there not been media attention and civil society attention on that, you know, uh, civil society organizations in Uganda, in Senegal, in uh, South Africa, for example, then I'm not sure that would have ever happened. So uh, in the tax space, it's much like the anti-corruption IFF space that Anna and Karina were talking about, where it's a mixed bag. But I, like Karina, uh, can only wake up every morning and do this job because I have to believe that uh, one sentence, one word, or one document can lead to a change somewhere. Definitely, definitely. Thank you, Will. And Ilya, will you, will you close uh, the panel? We have uh, about six minutes. Uh, sure. Uh, I sure. have questions. Uh, oh, we have questions. Don't okay. close, don't close. Okay. Okay, well, I would just wanted to make a, sort of a general point along the lines of, you know, if you look at this question of what has changed, I think if you think back to 2015, 2014, before the Panama Papers originally came out, and what the public conversation was about these topics, I think we will, I see everybody nodding, you know, it was very different. And maybe the concrete changes haven't always been what we would wish. Um, but I think that we're in a different world now than we were seven years ago. And, um, you know, one thing I noticed at the time is when the, Pan when the Panama Papers came out, the first sort of most visible political effect was the resignation of the prime minister of Iceland. <laughs> Iceland, and he, I mean, as far as I remember, hardly did anything wrong. I think he had a few offshore companies that didn't even have anything in them. Um, but, you know, the people were outraged and pretty soon he was gone. And, you know, Iceland is one of the most democratic countries in the world. So I think that speaks to the connection between this issue and sort of wider issues of 
the quality of your democracy. The stronger your democracy is, the more these kind of revelations are going to <clears throat> make uh, change because people just will not tolerate it and they will demand change. And in a responsive system, something will actually happen. But even in non-responsive, you know, I was talking earlier about Kyrgyzstan, where people came out to the streets and they said, this corrupt man will not, we will not let this party into parliament. Um, so I think that you kind of do, and when I talk to, you know, members of parliament, any, either, whether it's the European parliament or any parliament, and, and I ask, you know, what kind of things, what are the levers that, you know, that you need in order to push for changes, you know, they always mention journalism, they always mention investigations that actually make the public care, because if we're talking about political will, where does that come from? It comes from politicians feeling, uh oh, I need to do this, because otherwise people are going to throw me out. So, um, yeah, it's frustrating when things don't change, but I think that we do have, we should point to the, um, added the, the, the change in public consciousness that has happened since this all began. And as journalists, I think we have to keep trying and Lord knows it's hard, especially in this field. You know, we have to tell our stories clearly. We have to tell them in a compelling way that makes sense. We have to, it's very hard because these are super technical topics and we're trying to make them understood by ordinary people. You know, I ask myself, you know, is my buddy from back from my hometown who has never traveled outside, you know, is he going to understand this story and understand why it's important? And if he doesn't, I have failed and it's not, I can't blame it and say, oh, it's too complicated, you know, the topic, because it's my job as a journalist to convey it to ordinary people and make them see why it's important. Um, so we have to keep doing that. And I think, I think I have to believe that uh, it makes a difference in the long run. Thank you. Thank you, Ilya. So let's uh, open the floor to other questions that exist still. Yes. We have someone yes. from Oporto also. I'm, I'm, I'm talking from Lisbon. Mm -hmm. May I? Yeah, Margarida. Are you hearing me? Yes. I hope, I hope you do. First of all, uh, hello, Anna. Uh, thank you for um, being our moderator and in this panel, but indeed uh, your contribution uh, was uh, really important. We have here our students and they always uh, like to hear you, of course. Uh, and then I would like to thank and congratulate uh, Karina, Ilya, and uh, Will for their, um, not for their, only for their participation today in this panel, in our Congress, but indeed for their work. Uh, as an old professor of law, I would like to uh, tell you that you are not alone, that uh, universities all around the world, uh, professors of law, are indeed uh, also uh, listening to you, trying to understand how to make a better world without uh, corruption. So please don't feel alone and uh, don't uh, lose your activist um, role. Uh, of course, um, I know that there is a gap between uh, the legal world and the real world. And uh, that's why I'm going just to put forward a question because in human terms and human rights uh, perspective, it really uh, concerns me as professor of law. Uh, and the question is, do journalists have judicial procedures in these cases where your associations are working? The information you are disclosing is it publicly available? Or uh, on the other hand, it is not, I know that you can't reveal the sources of information. I know something about uh, journalism, but nevertheless, nevertheless, uh, we are working here since yesterday and you can't imagine what we have heard yesterday. Uh, one of our members of our parliament uh, said uh, clearly, that a political speech in an electoral campaign um, asking for anti-corruption measures and solutions does not give a vote to any political party. And so I was really concerned because if the politicians think that it is not worthy to speak about corruption, how in the earth 
who is going to talk about corruption. <laughs> we are doing our job here in the university with this Congress. Uh, we are working hard with um, our students in the three uh, levels, um, graduation, master and PhD. We are bringing up the issue of corruption in several fields, constitutional law, international law, uh, and in uh, all the uh, Portuguese speaking uh, countries, because we have many students from Brazil. And as you can imagine, uh, the issue of corruption in Brazil, the issue of corruption in Angola, the issue of corruption in Mozambique and other countries are uh, or is of utmost importance. So we are not forgetting to, um, to develop the, our studies in this field, but indeed, we need journalists to continue to do their job. And congratulations for your work. And please tell me, do you have procedures? in which countries uh, are you uh, being indicted anyway? Thank you. Thank you, Margarida. Any other questions? Yes, from Oporto. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our speakers here today. And thank you, Ana Gomes. Well, I cannot stress enough the, the, the work that you've been doing, all the journalists. And we have to imagine not only in corruption, but for instance, the, the question of Ukraine and Russia now, we can see how information is so important and fake news, how they mold our perceptions about the world and about everything. And uh, Anna is being so terrific in public debates. The follow-up of this, this, this uh, corruptive schemes are being addressed in Portugal today, especially because of her and all of her a public debate and public interest related to this. So thank you all. Um, I, I would like to, to, to anyone who would like to, to share their opinions, considering, well, we do not have, and we do not have sometimes some political will to change things. Um, civic society is, or civil society is not always aware of some things or interested, or they do not have the, enough activism to follow up these, these, these situations, but how do we deal when the corruptive schemes are political? For instance, in Portugal, as well, Anna is, is always talking about this, golden visas, for instance, we're selling our citizenship to the ones that can pay for it. A clear corruptive scheme sponsored by the government. Um, Questions about, for instance, the richest man in Portugal, Abram Abramovich, uh -huh. uh, that we're selling citizenship. He doesn't want the Portuguese citizenship. He wants the European Union citizenship, like the other ones that bought literally citizenship from the golden visas with corruptive schemes, money laundering. And we could see it, and especially, and we have our students here. Hopefully, they're not going to be enablers in the future. So. The Congress is also important to share the values related to their professions in the future. Um, but all of these are creating a human rights problem. Citizenship is being sold. I remember Anna Arendt saying citizenship is the right to have rights. And now <laughs> it's creating an apartheid. We're selling citizenship to the ones that have money to buy it, not to the ones they need and they have values to be a citizen. So some, some, some researchers talk about, well, let's forget about citizenship because now it's a scheme. It's nothing else but a scheme. And I'd like to, to hear your opinions about this political corruptive or allegedly corruptive schemes that are being sponsored by government. Thank you so much for your work. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any other questions? If not, we will have a final round to close. Uh, let me just say thank you for your words. Um, I think the, uh, we've been talking a lot about uh, Luanda Leaks because of course this is unfinished business and it's so significant. And obviously it's kind of a blueprint because of, obviously it's not just Luanda Leaks. We could talk of a Maputo Leaks, <laughs> not yet even up, uh, opened and, and many other leaks. Uh, where Portugal unfortunately plays a role as a as a laundromat, um, but of course the next big challenge, the one that is now also in front of us, is indeed 
enacting the Russian sanctions, the sanctions on the Russian oligarchs that have been uh, that has been uh, decided at the European level. And uh, and as you rightly just point out, I mean, here we are with Abramovich who used not even the golden visa scheme uh, in a, 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 a more reverse way, which is this uh, Sephardic law, um, uh, not, not called Sephardic law, it's actually a nationality law meant to restore rights for the Sephardis who were once expelled by the Inquisition and perverting it uh, uh, selling it to the uh, rich uh, uh, people with connections to the Kremlin, as we know, uh, uh, as the case of Abramovich. And we see no action, no action whatsoever. I must say, I myself sent stuff to the judiciary authorities. I know they have uh, started an inquiry, it's public, but we, we fail to understand why in this context of the sanctions that have been decided at the European level, there is no more speed in uh, indeed um, taking consequences out of what is already in the public domain. Thanks as well to the gr brilliant work by Portuguese journalists in exposing the way uh, Abramovich and, uh, and other uh, kleptocrats were proper and other criminals were probably, uh, were certainly abusing the the, the scheme, a scheme that has been obviously tolerated, to say the least, by the Portuguese authorities, the, the government in particular. Um, another question I'd like to point out is uh, to go on the positive side is that another area where the revelations have uh, changed dramatically the perception of the city of the people is indeed on the protection of whistleblowers, and we have now even a directive. To protect whistleblowers, we have other means to protect whistleblowers, and there is a conscience, a conscience, and there are whistleblowers bravely coming out. And many of these whistleblowers are actually professionals. I know many whistleblowers who are former bankers and former lawyers doing all this horrendous work that have obviously a connection, uh, not just with uh, the corruption and but uh, but also with human rights, um, and and that's what also acting on the Russian sanctions will indeed uh, make us hit the two aspects. Uh, the whistleblowers are coming out because they feel, uh, they feel uh, outraged with what they are supposed to do and at some point they rebelled and they, and, and they try to correct whatever they were meant to do. Uh, obviously, the importance of uh, protecting whistleblowers is very significant, and maybe uh, Will and, uh, and Lilia, well, when you address the question that was uh, put to you by Margarita on the, on the protection of journalists, you could also talk about the protection of whistleblowers in general, not, not just journalists, but whistleblowers in general. Uh, I'll, I'll give the floor. Uh, First to, to Will, then to Ilya, and then finally to Karina. Will? Thanks, Anna. Uh, to respond to a few of these points, uh, nothing makes me as a journalist happier than seeing uh, academics use data and investigations in their work. You know, to speak of other novel uh, advances just this week, I think a few days ago, uh, the academic Gabriel Zuckman and his colleagues, Annette and others, uh, published uh, a very impressive study on uh, using leaked data, if I understand correctly, on uh, all of these foreign nationals who've uh, been amassing property in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates, the new Switzerland uh, of the world. Uh, and of course, in many of those cases, that will be completely unknown and therefore undisclosed to local tax authorities. And that study was published in complementarity with uh, journalists. So there's a lot happening out there. And as I said, the great studies that have been done after the Panama Papers, after the Paradise Papers, for example, I think have led to real impacts as well. I've seen studies where the Colombian Tax Authority has worked with academics to understand the impact of, of investigative journalism and leaks. And I think that kind of stuff really matters too. Uh, I totally agree with Anna that the increased attention to and uh, protection uh, of whistleblowers is an important development. Of course, it's not protection, uh, you know, it's not the protection that needs to be in place. Mm -hmm. I'm still scandalized by the response of, for example, uh, Luxembourg, 
um, in how it treated the whistleblowers from LuxLeaks, for example. You know, a country that otherwise holds itself out to be some kind of perfect European model is in fact far from the case. Uh, literally working alongside uh, PwC, according to one report, to kind of hound these whistleblowers who provided information in the public interest. So there's still a long way to go. But once again, if we go to cultural norms and the baseline, like Ilya was saying, I think on whistleblowers also the baseline has shifted. And we see that at ICOJ. The number of uh, people reaching out to ICOJ, passing us documents, and also governments. You know, I've spoke, lots of governments acknowledge after and thanks to projects like the Panama Papers, they are now drowning in more leaked information than they've ever received before. What they do with it is, of course, the more important and follow-up question. Thanks, Anna. Thank you. Ilya? Thank you. Um, one thing I will address is the question about uh, legal threats to journalists, and that is something that we are always most frightened of in the United Kingdom, because it's uh, that's where libel laws are the scariest. Um, I've never really understood how the British tabloids can exist in the same country where investigative journalism can be so tricky, precisely because you can be a Russian or Ukrainian oligarch and then hire uh, British lawyers to basically, it's much harder to publish what we want to publish uh, because you have to prove there's additional burdens of proof on you. I'm not a legal expert. So in the presence of so many actual legal experts, I don't want to get it wrong. So I'm not going to go into specifics. But as I understand it, you know, if someone reads your story and and a judge thinks that they will reasonably conclude that this person is corrupt, even if you didn't say they're corrupt, you just laid out the facts, then in court, they can sue you and you have to prove that they are corrupt. You have to prove actually more than what you said in the story. And that kind of thing really hampers, you know, and as I said, it always comes back to the money. You know, we have at OCCRP, we have great lawyers who help us on a pro bono basis because we can't hire lawyers that will work in the same way that, you know, these oligarchs. And they don't just hire lawyers, they hire PR firms who go out and launder their stories and attack um, our stories afterwards. You know, oligarchs have their favorite journalists who um, they can they can hook up with and give all the documents and provide answers in a way that allows them to paint this narrative. So this battle for sort of the public over the public consciousness happens. It's not it's not just a question of getting our narrative out there. It's a question of countering, you know, some of the other narratives that are coming out there as well. Um, I think that you know I think that journalism is a public good. Journalism is like a fire brigade or uh, you know, a street cleaning crew or a train <laughs> or, or a bus. You know, journalism is something that's honest, independent journalism is something that society needs in order to function at its best. And I think that the current model is just, you know, we are fortunate, ICIJ is fortunate in many ways to have donors who help us. But um, I think that journalism should be supported by governments in a way that, that enables those journalists to be independent. Um, and there are models for doing that. And of course, there are models that are that don't work and that make those journalists become arms of the state. Uh, but uh, there are there are things wrong with sort of the funding model of journalism. And you see newsroom after newsroom disappearing. In the United States, where I'm from, you have vast deserts of local news where simply there is no local news left because the local papers could not support themselves. And so then everybody has to read the New York Times for any news, and then that has its own cultural issues. So there's a lot wrong with the sort of funding model behind uh, modern journalism. So I would say that if we're going to look at the root causes and look at what are the lev what levers can we give um, people like Anna, you know, to to make changes, it's it's getting the message to the public, and um, getting the message to the public means we need to have the resources to do our jobs, and we need to be able to do that without fear of um scan of um of uh, yeah, inappropriate lawsuits thank you so much Ilya. and now karina we are running really out of time so i, I would like uh, to thank you Anna. and I, I will be very quickly i think um just to take the the note on on um, on the role of politicians and politics decisions let's let's put it like this i think that political will, it's also proportional to political integrity. And I just want to stress that our national anti-corruption strategy 
uh, did not address political integrity issues such as revolving doors, the conflict of interest, you know, ethics in politics and, and also ethics in public service. So for me, uh, and to be honest, this is this is my opinion, when we see decisions regarding, you know, golden visa scheme or decisions regarding, you know, Luanda Lakes uh, uh, and Eurobic and, and, and other scandals that we're seeing or perceiving, I think that lack of enforce, enforcement of AML regulations, or uh, um, uh, even unregulate, unregulating key sectors such as the banking sector or the real estate sector, that it's regulated only on paper, but in practice, you know, regulation does not work. I think that has to do with the fact that we are not taking enough attention to political integrity issues, especially revolving doors and conflicts of interest. Uh, um, and for me, that's that's key for the coming future. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. Uh, thank you all. Uh, it's been really a pleasure. I'm sorry that we are 15 minutes uh, behind schedule, but uh, I think it was a very interesting debate. And uh, Karina just um, uh, introduced a kind of another <laughs> debate we could have. Maybe next time you hold this uh, conference. Thank you for having us. Uh, uh, been able to address you and uh, and take your question. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.